Good morning, welcome to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. We'll be beginning our Sunday school hour in just a couple of minutes. this morning for our Savior Jesus. Thank you for the Sunday School Hour where we can learn about living practically the Christian life and learn truth from the Scripture. Please be with us this morning and meet with us. May you speak to our hearts as individuals. God, I pray that each child and each adult here today would be spoken to and would be challenged to live for Jesus. And we thank you for what you're going to do now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please be seated if you're in the adult class. The teens can be dismissed to the... 
uh, whatever that is. And Mrs. Price has got the rest of the kids in the back. Second Kings 5. I'm sorry, 4. Second Kings 4. We're going to be finishing up our series on Elisha and the ministry, the double portion. The ministry of Elisha, the double, as we've been seeking the double portion of the Spirit, of the Spirit of God in our lives. This series has been enlightening and an encouragement. And I hope it's an, hope and pray it's been an enlightenment and an encouragement to you as we've been in Second Kings for the last, oh, four weeks. We'll be finishing up our series in, in, um, with this this week. We're not going to get to cover all the miracles of Elisha. Sorry. We're just There's a lot there. I, so I encourage you, maybe in addition to what you've been reading through, if you've been uh, reading through your Bible chronologically, you should be in the book of Exodus right now. Um, if you're reading your Bible canonically, you'll probably, you're probably somewhere in Exodus, maybe in Leviticus, depending on how fast you read it. If you've just been picking and choosing where you've been reading for the Bible, I'm just glad you're reading the Bible. Amen? But I have been would encourage you, if you've been following our series, to go into 2 Kings and read, and, and read about some of these other miracles. But we're going to look, we're going to focus on three as we wrap up our series. And I've entitled this message, Used Even in Death, but that's going to be the third of the miracles we're going to be looking at this morning. I've asked you to turn to 2 Kings 4. Let's pray, and we'll read verses 1 through 7. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together to learn from your word. And God, I pray in the Sunday school hour that you would just use, us, that you would just use your word in a great and mighty way, Help us to learn from it. Help us to see as we conclude this series just what you are capable of. And help us as we seek the double portion in our own lives that you would empower us with your spirit. Help me to communicate your word clearly this morning, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Kings 4. The Bible says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bonded. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. So we're wrapping up our series in the ministry of Elisha, continuing to seek the double portion of God's Spirit that we sorely need in this day. We've sorely needed it our whole lives, have we not? But it, I feel like even more so as the days are drawing closer and closer, it seems, to the return of the Lord that we, that we sorely need the double portion of God's Spirit in our lives. And the time would fail us to look at every single miracle God wrought through his chosen prophet Elisha. But today we're focusing on a few of these and we're starting here with the increase of the widow's oil. Now here this woman is widow when her husband, who was the breadwinner the source of financial security, and also was a um, was of the sons of the prophets, 
under Elisha. We had looked at that in a couple weeks back. We saw what the sons of the prophets were. These were the schools of those who were training for the ministry. So this, so this, so this, so this uh, husband had had been in this school. So had had served. At some in some capacity, either under Elisha or under another per, uh, or under somebody else who had served under Elisha, but was strong, but was but she was connected to Elisha in some way through her husband. Her husband had now passed, and she has a problem because her husband has passed. There's no source of income coming in. He was the breadwinner. He was the financial provider of the house. And she was widowed. And furthermore, she has a debt. And she's not able to pay this debt because she is not able to work. In Levitical law, keep your finger in 2 Kings 4. And turn with me, I want to turn to a couple of different passages real quick this morning. The first of which is going to be Exodus 21. This is just the, um, the one of the laws about this uh, about servants. Uh, now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Now that's now we're going to tie this passage in with another passage I'd like to look at in Leviticus chapter 25. Join me in Leviticus 25. We'll look at verses 39 and following. This is where it's going to be the, uh, serv the bond servant passage. 39. The Bible says, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor, be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, but as a hired servant. And as a sojourner, he shall be with thee, and shall serve thee unto the year of jubilee. That would be the every, every seven years that would be, the, would be considered the jubilee year in the Levitical law, in which case all the bond servants would be let free, and restore and, and restored as basically as they were. And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his father shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you, of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondsmaids. Uh, moreover, are the children of the strangers that so sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and other families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. Uh, you shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession, and they shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with rigor. And then you can read on through the last verses um, some more about the how the bond serving worked. So, under the Levitical law, and you can also read on your own time, Deuteronomy chapter 15, which continues on. But that's just kind of a basis of where, where if there was a debt to be paid, a creditor could take the sons of the widow to be used as bondmen to pay off the debt. Now, we do know that this is pretty far away from a time, and Israel, as a nation, is pretty far away from God. Would they necessarily have returned the children in the, in the next Jubilee year? We don't know. So this woman could have feared that I might be given my, I may not see my sons again. So she's got a very deep concern here. She may think, she may think oh, maybe these, maybe these men will do right, and in the Jubilee year I'll get them back, but there's no guarantee of that. But anyway, she had a reason to be concerned. They could, her, son, her sons could be sold sold as a slavery into slavery as bond slaves to be to pay off the debt, but they may never have been returned to her. So she has come pleading to Elisha for help. 
And she knows, because of what her husband has done, of the power that Elisha, the prophet, has with God. She came knowing of his power and what God could do through his servant. Elisha hears her request. So he asks the woman if she has anything. And sure enough, she has one singular pot of oil. We're not sure how big this pot was. We do not know how much oil was already in the pot. It could have been a full pot, could have been half a pot, could have been a couple of measly drops. But what's going to happen here is going to be an incredible miracle. So he, so Elisha goes and says, all right, now, before we look at what Elisha does here, I want to, make, I want to bring up a point. What she had was one singular pot of oil. What she has, she is giving to God for his use. And what she doesn't have, she is willing to trust God to provide. Interesting point. God is pleased when we trust him. When our bank accounts are dry and we have a need, and we say, we give this to God. What we have we give to God for his use. And what we don't have, we need to be willing to trust God to provide. The prophet sends her to go borrow pots. But I love what he says here. He says, borrow, go, go borrow the vessels abroad, all thy neighbors. Even empty vessels, borrow not a few. What's the implication? Go find vessels. Plan on bringing back all the vessels you can. Borrow not a few. The faith of this woman is about to be tested. How many vessels do you think it's going to take to go and pay off this debt? We don't know how large this debt was. This could have been a small debt. This could, have, But it would have been a pretty significant debt if it meant taking her sons and selling them into slavery for who knows how long. This woman's faith is tested here because she says, you know, Go, go find, go, let's go to every neighbor, borrow those vessels. Don't be ashamed to go borrow, don't be ashamed to go borrow them. She could have been ashamed to go borrow them. She could have been like, what's this got to do with anything? I have a need here. What's borrowing vessels going to do? She didn't say that. When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and set aside that which is full. She goes out borrows these vessels. The concept here is that God is answering, God, like, God is going to answer her request according to her diligence and faithfulness in borrowing these pots from the neighbors. And this had to take some humility on her part. I mean, oh, I have to wonder myself if I'd be willing, if, 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 if it were simple enough to pay, if I had a debt I couldn't pay, would I be willing to go, and, and, and I was told, go borrow pots from your neighbors, borrow not a few? wonder how many pots I'd gather. wonder how many pots you'd gather. Borrow not a few. You have a need. Just go and accomplish it. She could have been embarrassed or ashamed to ask her neighbor for pots, but she was not ashamed. Sure enough, she comes back with all these pots. She must have come back with quite a few. Let's come back with quite a few pots. I'm getting feedback this morning. There, I'll pull a pastor for you. When she returned, she poured out the one pot of oil onto the vessels. But now note this. Verse 5. So she went from him, shut the door upon her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her. She poured out. Now, what, what normally happens when we pour something from one thing into another? Doesn't the thing we originally pour out of empty? Mm -hmm. If you have a cup of water. Usually I pour milk or coke out of a bottle into another one so it doesn't all the way empty. But, you, but you have like one, one or two sips. <laughs> does that, does that coke, all right, let me ask you a question, uh, Brother Johnny. When you're pouring a can, let's say you're pouring out a bottle of coke into an, an, an empty cup. When you have those one or two drops of Coke left in that bottle because you can't quite get them out, does that Coke automatically refill? 
Yes, because I get another bottle. But but that <laughs> you are destroying the illustration. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> we kid with each other all the time. If you're new to the live stream. No. That bottle of Coke, that original bottle of Coke does not refill. It only refills if Brother So and So and Brother Johnny goes and gets another bottle of Coke. At least one more. At least one at least one more. <laughs> Bring your Coca-Cola's not a few. Um Alright. So normally, under a normal circumstance, that one bottle of Coke, when it's pour, completely poured out, does not refill automatically. In the same token, so under a normal circumstance, this woman's oil would have run out. It would have been like Maxwell House, good to the last drop. But here, this is going to be a superseding miracle. Because guess what? She brings another vessel, there's still more oil in there. And another vessel, so fills up those vessels, another vessel comes in, pours out, more oil. Fills it up, puts it aside, more oil, more oil. Verse 6. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. All these vessels this woman got were now completely full. Every vessel she has collected. She ran out. She ran out of vessels now. So she goes to Elisha. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. We're in 2 Kings 4. She ran out. She, told, she ran into Elijah. Elisha, who told her to sell the oil, pay her debt, live her and her family off the rest. The faithfulness of this woman to go and get enough vessels that she could not only pay her original debt, which, again, could have been a very significant amount. It would have had to have been something significant if it meant giving her children up as slave, to be enslaved, possibly for the rest of their lives. Not only that, she lives debt-free for the rest of her life, and she gets to live off that, her and her children, off the rest of the oil. That's a great encouragement, and it's a great challenge. What would I be willing to do to help myself or help somebody else in a similar situation? What we have, we need to give to God for his use, and what we don't have, we need to trust God to provide. 2 Kings 4, verse 38. Let's look, look at the second miracle. This is one we're not going to be spending a whole lot of time on because it's a pretty short passage. Verses 38, and we'll read through to the end of 41. Let's see another miracle here that Elisha's going to do. So... We see here that we can trust God to provide in a situation, in a big situation. That was a big deal. This woman was going to have, that woman, that widow there could have lost both her sons to, 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 slave, to, to be enslaved, to pay off the debt. The, under Levitical law, it would have only been until the next Jubilee year. But who knows if they were, but who knows, if, but Israel had fallen so far from God, they could have been slaves for the rest of their life. They may not have been following the Jubilee. Who knows if they were actually even following the Jubilee year at this point. They had fallen so far away from God. On another occasion, Elisha was used for a much smaller, but yet I want to note, still important purpose. I've asked you to turn to 2 Kings 4, and I'm going to start reading in verse 38. The Bible says, And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth famine in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seize pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. 
So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. But he said, as would be Elisha, then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. What another inter another very interesting miracle. I happen to like this one a lot. So Elisha is here used to, I'm, I'm going to jokingly put this in air quotes, not waste food, so to speak. But I want to see it's more than not wasting food. No. There's a famine in the land here. When there's a famine in the land, what is there not a lot of? Food. food. There's not a lot of food available. It's either very hard to grow or can't be grown for some reason or another. There's a famine in the land. So whatever they could have was of very big importance and may have needed to last a lot longer than in instances when food is plenty. Here the sons of the prophets were meeting Elisha in Gilgal. And they're going to have a meal of pottage. Or so they thought. Now, one had went out, he gathered, gathered herbs, but unawarely grabbed a wild vine which had these wild gourds, which were not only inedible, but also harmful if they were consumed, if they, if, if, if they if a high quantity had been consumed. That's why they cried out and said, O master, there is death. O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. They knew this was not something that sat well. They did not recognize it until the pottage had been completed, poured out, and each had at least eaten, you know, maybe a couple of bites. And they're like, oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. They could not eat thereof. This was a big, this was a, this was a problem. There's a famine in the land. When's their next meal going to be? Was it going to be a day? Two days? Three days? This was a problem. This wasn't just a matter of wasting food. This was an op this was a missed opportunity that they could have had three or four. This could have been a while before they had their next meal again. And sure enough, this would have been a hard meal to give up. Sometimes we can taste something and be like, ah, oh, this isn't so good. And we just toss it out thinking, oh, I'll go run out to Publix and get chicken tenders or something, or I'll go run to go run into the drive-thru. Guess what? There wasn't a 24-hour McDonald's around this time in, uh, in Israel in these days. We didn't, they didn't have that kind of thing. There was a famine in the land. You know when you're going to get your next meal. It's a hard meal to give up. Food is hard to come by. To lose a whole meal like that, this would have been, this was a terrible situation. But yet Elisha had a solution. Now he asks for meal here. So he says, then bring meal. Cast it into the pot, and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. There's no harm in the pot. Meal is a thickening agent, which in itself is really only thickened to pottage. It was a thickening agent. So he takes, casts meal into the pot. Now they would have probably dumped their original, they would have probably dumped their, either they would have either dumped their original dish, maybe on the ground next to them, or dumped it back into the pot. Re, uh, Elisha cast the meal into the pot, re-stirred it, re-dished it back, down, back out. However it happens. And God performs another miracle here in that when, they, when he poured the meal in, re-stirred it, re-dished it out, it says, pour out for the people that they may eat. All of a sudden, the, the, gourd, the herb, herbs that caused the problem that they could not eat of because it was po it poisonous, it was nothing. It was not good for the body. Even though those, even though those were still in there, the meal worked as a miracle in that it took away that agent. It took away that poisoning agent of the of the pot that was in, of the of the herbs. Elisha. So instead of the meal being a thickening agent, Elisha, through the power of God, used it 
to offset the poisonous herbs that were gathered and mixed in with the pottage. Now, if God, here's, here's the point I get out of this passage, in combination with the other passage we looked at in 2 Kings 4, God cares for the great needs, like the, widows, like, the widows, uh, like the widow had here with her sons that could have been sold into slavery. And he also cares for the small needs of his servants in such a time as a famine. You can trust God with the big things, and you can trust God with the small things. Amen? Amen. 2 Kings 13. We're going to wrap this series up. We're going to look at the death of Elisha. Now, I'm failing to cover in this series some of the other great small miracles. There's an incident in 2 Kings 6 where there's, an, there's a floating axe head. That's a great story. I love to preach from that sometime. I'll have to preach from that sometime, maybe in a Sunday evening message. There's another one about lepers. We looked at some of the great miracles that Elisha, through the power of God, had wrought in his life. But now I want to see that he was used even in death. 2 Kings 13. Start reading in verse 14 and following. Now Elisha was fallen sick of a sickness whereof he died. And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou have consume them. We'll stop there for just a second. We're looking at Elisha's final miracles. The man of God has now fallen ill, and he is going to die of this sickness. But he's going to be used to give one last prophecy and perform one last miracle. The last king Elisha served under in Israel was Jehoash. Now, it's spelled Joash in, in many occasions in your scripture, most notably earlier in 2 Kings chapter 13. But it's spelled that way, but it's not the same as the same as Joash, which is spelled that way. That was a king of Judah, just to differentiate things for you. Upon hearing that the man of God was sick, he went to him, wept, and cried out a familiar phrase. Remember when we covered this phrase a little bit earlier in, in, our, in the first week in our series in 2 Kings 2? When Elisha had cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. Interesting that now the king of Israel has done this to Elijah's successor, Elisha. Interesting. Elisha was one of the greatest allies any king could have ever had. And he was not even a high-ranking war general. But he was a man of God. And even a king like... Jehoash, Jehoash, who was, who followed evil, he, he was not a good king, he did evil in God's sight, he also followed after kings before him and not departing from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, we looked at that a couple of weeks ago, from 1 Kings chapter 12. But even still, Jehoash had some sort of knowledge of God, what, of who God was, what God did, and what the servant of God, in this case, Elisha, had. Still recognized the important role Elisha had in service to him. So Elisha directs the king to take a bow and some arrows and shoot. And when the king did, Elisha detailed how he would deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Syrians. So in order to consume the Syrians, Jehoash would have to smite the ground with an arrow. Ah, you would think, oh, it's so easy. Wouldn't take much, right? Let's ask you a question. If you, um, 
if you were to smite somebody, if you were to smite somebody, I'm not saying you should, if you were to smite somebody, after how many times would you think you would have to smite them for them to realize, you know what, this guy who's smiting me, who's beating me up, probably not a good idea to mess with him any, mess with them anymore. How many times you would think that would be the case? Once, twice, maybe twice, three times, maybe, depending on how strong the other person is. Depends how good you smite them. Depends on how good you smite them. Depends on how hard you hit. There's a bunch of different things, a bunch of different scenarios. Verse 18. And he said, take the arrows. And he, that would be Jehoash, took them. Elisha said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice, three times, and stayed. You would, so Jehoash says, okay, I'm going to shoot three arrows and think, oh, the Syrians aren't going to come a fourth time. They think they've been beaten back three times. They're not going to come a fourth. Elisha was not pleased. Verse 19. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. You see this prophecy fulfilled in verse 25. I'll skip down and read verse 25. The Bible says, And Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel. Now, Ben-Hadad is going to be Haziel's successor as king of Syria. That's where the side note is. Took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father, by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recover the cities of Israel. So there is that prophecy being fulfilled that Elisha said. But, now how many arrows do you think Elisha had given to Jehoash? Well, you know there's at least three. But note what Elisha says here when he says, Thou should have smitten five or six times. That means that Jehoash had at least six arrows. He could have more than six arrows. Should not the king have fired all the arrows? Mm -hmm. Would you and I have fired all the arrows if it meant our enemies would have been consumed? a valuable lesson. Jehoash only fired three arrows. He should have fired as many as he had. But he had the opportunity to consume his enemies, the Syrians. But they would only be delivered three times. A valuable lesson in faith again. We saw the faith of the widow in gathering pots. But we saw not the faith of the king. The king was told, "You're gonna every time, every arrow you shoot, you'll be delivered from Syri from the Syrians." He thought, "Eh, I'm only gonna shoot three. Should have shot every arrow he had, and probably should have gone back to Elisha and said, you got any more arrows?'" Well, we know the king did not seek God like the widow did. The widow had faith. Obviously, she would have known about Elisha and the power he had from her husband, seeing what her husband had done. Jehoaz, Jeho Jehoash, sorry, Jehoash knew about Elisha, knew about the power he had, and yet only stops halfway. Should have smote him five or six times. He stopped halfway. You know what happens when we stop halfway? We don't accomplish everything God wants us to accomplish. We only get the job half done. 
we're getting 10,000 Bibles in a matter of a few days here in Fort Lauderdale. How many of these Bibles are we going to get out? Are we going to think after 5,000 Bibles, are we going to stop and say, we've gotten enough Bibles out. we got 5,000 Bibles out. We're tired. Our feet are sore. I'm done handing out Bibles. We're going to be like Jehoash. I'm done shooting arrows. We gotta stop halfway. Can't stop halfway. We need to seek God. The king did not seek God like the widow did. If we were the king, would we have shot any arrows at all? Would we have stopped halfway? Or would we have shot every single arrow Elisha had given us? I'd like to I'd like to think I'd have shot every single arrow. But knowing me in my own heart. I probably would have. I don't even think I would have stopped halfway. I might have. I might have slot, shot one arrow and think, "Oh, I stink at shooting these. I gotta stop." <laughs> Didn't matter how good he shot him. He was only told to just shoot. Now I want to see how Elisha's gonna die, but yet be used in death. Verse twenty. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming end of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, they spied a band of men. They cast the man that they were burying into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. So Elisha dies, they bury him. Sometime later, another man presumably in a war with the Moabites, had passed, into com had passed away in combat. And he was cast into the sepulchre, sepulchre of Elisha. When the deceased man had touched the very bones of the prophet, of the man of God, he revived. Elisha was used even after he was dead. Just his very bones were used mightily by God to bring back to bring life to a man after he had lost it. What's the lesson here? Our life can still speak volumes and be used even after our physical body awaits its glorious rapture, Christian. Would what we did on earth be used long after we're gone, our kids, those we want to Christ in our lives, how would our testimony be used by God on earth long after our physical bodies are dead and awaiting the rapture? Something to take home with you. That's something to take home and think about and pray about. As we have sought through the ministry of Elisha this month, in January, we recognize and realize, you and I, we need the double portion of God's Spirit in our lives. We looked at many miracles that Elisha had done through God's power. We need the double, you and I, we need the double portion of God's Spirit in our lives. And guess what? You and I, we can have it. It's available to us. Now, may we write, write these same miracles? Maybe not. But in different ways, different miracles will be done. Right outside these walls, in every direction you go, south, east, west, north, right outside these four walls are people waiting to hear, and who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Let's pray that God will empower us for this task. This is an important task which we need to, we need to follow. We're not going to distribute five. Guess what? We're not going to distribute 5,000 Bibles. We're getting in 10,000. We're going to distribute 10,000 with God's help. Let's pray how we are going to be used in this process.
Let's pray for God to fill us with his spirit. More than that, fill us with the double portion which we need, which we sorely need. We can have it if we just ask and believe. Let's thank God for what we learned. We'll pray for the service. And we'll be dismissed a, uh, a minute or two early. Heavenly Father, thank you for the examples of Elisha, the prophet. How you used him in a great and mighty way, Lord, in many different miracles. We only scratch the surface of his ministry, of the ministry you allowed him to have, of the power you wrought in his life. In so doing, you left us a great you left us many great examples. I pray that like the widow who sought after all the vessels, that we would seek all the vessels that are out there and fill them all. Borrow not a few, as your word says. I pray that we can trust you with the big things in life. I pray we can trust you with the small things in life like the sons of the prophets did here when there was death in the pot. And Lord, I pray that you would use us to not do things half-heartedly, but to do them wholly. We can, we can help us to shoot, help us to get out all 10,000 of these Bibles. Get them out quickly. Get them out into the right hands. Get them out into hands. Get them to people who will be open to your word. Lord, I know that 10,000 Bibles does not even begin to scratch the surface of how many people and how many households and how many families live in the city of Fort Lauderdale. But I pray that these 10,000 that we will be using and we will be distributing are used in a great and mighty way. They get into the hands of people who will read, into people who will see your word, read your word, and be open to truth and be open to understanding their need of a Savior. God, I pray for this service to come that you would speak to our hearts again. Thank you for the series. Thank you for the ministry of Elisha. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Service will begin in about 15 minutes.